You're listening to Tim Bulkley's 5-Minute Bible. I've been marking various student assignments on Genesis recently, and that, together with some conversations at church, have caused me to be thinking once again about those promises to the patriarchs in Genesis, and about the vexed problem of whether those promises are as unconditional as the words seem, or whether the promises are indeed conditional. Now, the issue isn't a trivial one, because it has deep political implications. Now, it's no wonder that Christians want to expect those promises to be unconditional. The notion of grace, free, unmerited gift, is central to our theology. But whether we want them unconditional or not, the fact remains that those promises to the patriarchs are potentially deeply political with implications for the current politics of the Middle East. If they are unconditional, then the result is Zionism and Christian Zionism, unqualified support for the State of Israel, perhaps. There are two kinds of people who assume that the promises are unconditional. The literalists, there is no condition spoken by God in the words, so there is no condition. And some scholars who follow Weinfeld. Weinfeld noticed that there were two ancient Near Eastern models for covenants in the Bible. Land grants and vassal treaties. Vassal treaties had conditions clearly expressed. And they are like the Sinai covenant. Royal grants, on the other hand, did not have conditions expressed. They were unconditional, says Weinfeld. Well, let's examine this a bit. Firstly, those promises to the patriarchs are clearly, according to Genesis, the consequence of things that the patriarchs have done. In Genesis 22, that dark chapter where Abraham has been tested by the demand that he sacrifice Isaac, we read, Indeed, I will bless you and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring all the nations of the earth will gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. The promises are restated again, and that because is quite strong. In Hebrew it's Echev Asher, as a consequence of the fact that it's one of the strongest ways Hebrew has of expressing a consequence. The promise is a consequence of Abraham's obedience. And it's the same in Genesis 26. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven, and will give your offspring all these lands, and all the nations of the earth shall gain blessing for themselves through your offspring, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Again, the promise is explicitly stated as being a consequence of Abraham's obedience. Now let's go back to those royal grants. Were they as unconditional as Weinfeld assumed? The words were unconditional, but Johnson has shown that the examples offered by Weinfeld himself of unconditional grants looked at in the larger contexts of the texts were actually conditional. That's to say, the kings were not making unconditional grants, as the words suggested, but the grants were in fact conditional upon ongoing faithful service by the person and their family who was the beneficiary of the grant. Royal grants, though expressed in unconditional language, were not unconditional. And indeed, that fits with the very nature of covenant. Covenant is more about relationships than legalities. Covenant implies three conditions. Two parties, some promises, and some conditions. And why would Abraham be tested? like in Genesis chapter 22, that horrible chapter, 
and many times according to Jewish tradition, if his obedience, his trust in the one making the covenant, were not crucial to the covenant itself. No, though they are expressed in unconditional language, the promises to the patriarchs are not unconditional. They depend upon the trust and obedience of the people of Israel.